sign up your name and we'll get in touch with you and, and you can learn more. With that said, it's our great pleasure to welcome Vitalik Buterin uh, to be our, our keynote next. Uh, Vitalik has been very important to Radical Exchange for a number of reasons. Um, he has obviously been a collaborator with Glenn Weil. Um, Glenn's story is that uh, when Vitalik first got in touch with him, Glenn sent him a version of his book and 20 pages came back of the most incisive comments uh, Glenn has seen through his work. In addition, I think Glenn would uh, admit that um, in terms of the following of his papers, uh, as Vitalik's uh, mentioned things on his Twitter, um, it's cascaded in for Glenn in terms of, of the following. Uh, and since then they've been collaborators and uh, Vitalik's been very supportive of our community here. Um, I'm sure a lot of you will know his work, uh, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna introduce it nonetheless. So he's best known for having conceptualized and co-founded Ethereum. It's uh, often discussed as a, as a, as a cryptocurrency, but uh, actually it's a public blockchain-based distributed computing platform and operating system featuring smart contracts scripting functionality. He first discovered blockchain and cryptocurrency technologies through Bitcoin uh, well before uh, almost everyone here, I'm sure, in, in 2011, and was immediately excited by the technology's potential. So he's now the leader of Ethereum's research team, working on future versions of the protocol. Uh, and he's going to talk to us about why cypherpunks and radical exchangers, which I, I guess we can refer to our, ourselves in this conference, can be friends and what they can learn from each other. Uh, with a shared and parallel history, um, I think uh, radical exchange and cryptocurrency blockchain communities have a, have a lot to uh, coalesce around. So I'd like to welcome Vitalik Peter into the stage. Hello, everyone. How are you feeling today? Great. Okay. So uh, I thought I would just get straight into things because I'm terrible at intros. Um, so the, um, here we are today you know, like at the uh, first uh, Radical Exchange Conference, and I personally tend to go more to spend uh, a lot of my time going to like, blockchain and cryptocurrency conferences. And it's definitely a kind of quite a bit of contrast between the two, but at the same time, you know, you can find a lot of similarities, right? So you can find that even though in one of them, you know, people talk about currencies, cryptocurrencies, decentralized exchanges, DAO as a proof of stake and various other buzzwords, here you know, there's a lot of discussion around quadratic voting, harborger taxes, open borders, charter cities, and like a whole set of different buzzwords. But at the same time, there's a lot of things that are kind of shared in common, right? So there's, a, in general, a kind of interest in just you know, making the world better, a kind of idealism, just an excitement about new ideas, a kind of commitment to not just thinking and talking, but also actively doing and experimenting, and really of many other commonalities that I wanted to talk about. So first, some history, right? So the kind of blockchain movement as it is today traces its roots from the uh, big Bitcoin movement, which originated in 2009, which itself traces its roots from this kind of earlier cypherpunk movements that has this um, famous uh, declaration of the inner independence of cyberspace was uh, published in the 1990s, but really it's existed in some form since the 1970s, right? And this document is often viewed as a kind of seminal inspiring document, especially for kind of older cypherpunks in the you know, 1990s and 2000s. And this was this sort of ideology that, you know, there's something very deeply wrong about kind of politics and corporations and governments as they exist today. And the internet and encryption kind of offer the ability to kind of pass, kind of non-confrontationally and peacefully just opt in to a completely different and what people thought hopefully better model, right? And so one of uh, the kind of properties of this 
early cypherpunk tradition is uh, this sort of very strong um, individualistic mindset. So basically this idea that it's, uh, you know, you personally making a decision that I'm going to switch from being kind of part of the old world and we're going to be part of the new world. And the new world is on the internet. Nobody, you know, nobody knows you're a dog and like all of those quotes. And it's something that can just exist on its um, on its own and grow on its own and doesn't really even needs to interface that much with existing power structures and ultimately at some point should just overturn and topple the existing power structures or um, as uh, the uh, manifesto prefers to say and make their inf uh, enforcement impossible so these were some of the beginnings and a lot these were some of the ideas that inspired people that would be working on you know things like encryption for encryption for messaging encryption for storing data torrent networks and file file sharing and all of these other things that people were talking about in the 2000s but then in uh 2009 um the uh, kind of a new part of this uh, space came into the picture right so this is a pretty seminal event that i think uh had a lot of impact on people in both the kind of more traditional uh, mainstream political circles and uh, people in these uh, cypherpunk communities. And this was basically the 2007-2008 financial crisis. Right? And what's interesting about the, cri the financial crisis is that it got interpreted by these two com communities. And in here, by two communities, I don't mean cypherpunk and radical exchange. I actually mean cypherpunk and kind of mainstream in fairly different ways, right? So a lot of people in the mainstream basically saw this as a kind of indictment of basically neoliberal free market capitalism. And they saw it as a sign that people should instead move to a model where kind of governments control financial systems more and things like that. But a lot of people in this kind of internet libertarian tradition instead viewed it more as a kind of indictment of just the existing kind of mainstream institutional hege hegemony in general, uh, central banks and commercial banks both included with a kind of equal level of derision. So, the, um, now, in, in the mainstream, this, of course, led to you know, some of the more recent pushes for a financial regulation, Dodd-Frank Act, blah, blah, blah. Um, here um, in the uh, cypherpunk community, this was one of these kind, one of the kind of big pushes that led to at least a lot of the early interest in Bitcoin. Right? So the Bitcoin white paper was uh, published in October 2008, and Bitcoin the blockchain was first launched on uh, January 3rd, 2009. Um, and inside of the Genesis block, so inside of the first block of the Bitcoin blockchain, you can actually look into the block contents and the, there's this kind of memo field in the block that actually contains these words, Chancellor on brink of a second bailout for banks, uh, the times uh, 2009, January 3rd. So, even kind of Satoshi himself, now you could argue that he was just trying to make a timestamp, but you know, really there's a lot of ways to make a timestamp. And this was clearly some kind of, this was clearly a statement, right? That um, this is uh, not, ju not just about um, making a peer-to-peer -peer digital currency. This was, re this was really more about something different and something, uh, and something greater. Um, so, since then, lots of things happened, right? Um, so, and I'll explain these pictures. Um, <laughs> so in, kind of two in 2009, 2010, 2012, the Bitcoin community was uh, mostly just people kind of passively off working in a corner, just kind of doing their, their own thing, slowly growing Bitcoin over time, getting really, really excited when WordPress started accepting Bitcoin for the first time. Yay! Um, and in, at the, in 2013, Bitcoin, and if people started expanding, experimenting a lot with cryptocurrencies other than Bitcoin, and uh, the Ethereum white paper was uh, published at the beginning of 2014. Now, this was around the time when things kind of stopped being all, um, all rosy in many ways. So Bitcoin uh, governance uh, 
quickly um, um, hit one of its first, uh, well, really its first major crisis, which was the uh, Bitcoin block size debate. And uh, what happened here is basically that um, Bitcoin um, for, had a uh, limit on the, the size of a block in its blockchain. So there's a limit of uh, 1 million bytes, so about 1 megabyte for, uh, for, um, that any block could have, and that was all of the space that you could use to fit transactions. In the first sort of four years of Bitcoin's history, nobody really cared about this, and people just uh, uh, thought, oh, you know, like it's really big, it's kind of a faraway problem, because at the time, with the transaction volume that existed at the time, blocks were maybe 30 kilobytes, 50 kilobytes in size. Then blocks went up to 200 kilobytes, 250 kilobytes. Eh, okay, maybe we should start, maybe th start thinking about how we'll think about this. 400 kilobytes, 600 kilobytes. And suddenly and pretty unexpectedly, the debate kind of split into these two camps, right? Where one camp basically said, well, we should just increase the block size. We should just change the rules of the protocol. So instead of the limit being 1 million bytes, the limit goes up to 8 million bytes. The other camp basically said that doing um, this kind of protocol change, what's called, what was called a hard fork, would be too risky or uh, either too technologically risky or too politically risky or both. And instead, they um, adopted this uh, kind of this some of more complicated technical fix called segregated witness, followed that, that would be followed by relying on a more complicated layer two technologies like the Lightning Network. And so we had these different camps, right? So the uh, thing on the uh, the guy on the left is uh, that small blocks with the uh, Lightning symbols they're representing all the other transactions happening on the Lightning Network, and the side on the right prefers uh, bigger blocks. This eventually was led to a split, and the majority of the Bitcoin community went with a small block side, and the big block side basically kind of forked off the chain, uh, renamed itself Bitcoin Cash, changed its logo to green, changed the, the uh, logo orientation from uh, tilt, uh, clockwise to counterclockwise, and uh, went on its merry way. Now, well, not so merry. The two continued to bitterly argue with each other over internet forums, but... This is what kind of what happened, right? Now, on the other side, you have, I mean, inside of Ethereum, which is this platform that lets you like, basically create, I mean, among other things, create smart contracts, which are uh, computer programs that control money. Well, eventually, this, someone created this big computer program called uh, the DAO, which stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization, which is like this decentralized, basically a decentralized venture fund where all of the participants who originally put money into it would be able to vote on where the money goes. The DAO got hacked, and, and because uh, and when the DAO got hacked, there was something like over a hundred million dollars of coins inside of the DAO. And at the time, this was. Uh, a pretty large percentage of the entire supply uh, supply of um, of ether, and so there was this big debate where basically should we institute a majority a, an, an emergency and of exceptional protocol change to basically reverse the effects of the hack, and this and a lot of people dislike this. They kind of perceived it as being very similar to a bailout, which is the exact thing that they thought that they were fighting against. But a lot of other people thought that this was just a very pragmatic measure to stop like 10% of all of the um, ether in existence from just going into the hands of some random hacker. And the hard fork happened, but this ended up leading into a split between two other different cryptocurrencies, the other of which is called Ethereum Classic. So takeaways for cypherpunks, right? So as I kind of mentioned earlier, the cypherpunk tradition started off in this kind of very individualist way. But one of, my, one of my theses here is that the cypherpunks' attempt to get into the money business kind of forced them to realize some other things along the way, right? And that other thing is that money is this fundamentally social thing in a much deeper way than, say, two-party encrypted communications, right? If I want to talk to you through an encrypted messenger, the only two people that needs to have anything to do with is me and you. No one else needs to know that conversation exists. No one else needs to speak the same protocol or the same language. If I want to send you 10 Bitcoins or 10 Ether, that is a transaction that has to be um, published and uploaded onto a global ledger and with rules that everyone agrees to. Um, and everyone needs to download and verify that data. And even just those technical factors just just structurally mean that cryptocurrencies just cannot avoid dealing with 
you know, the issues that inevitably arise when people have to be on a common protocol. You have to start thinking about governance, social contracts, what are the kind of common shared expectations of this community, how do, how do changes get made, how do we decide how changes get made, how, how do we decide um, how we discuss, uh, discuss things, what are the norms of discourse, and all of these other kind of very political things. And even to this day, there's um, people who would disagree with me, and there's people who say things on Twitter like, oh, but, you know, there is, no, there is no Bitcoin community, there's just a bunch of people that happen to use this, uh, the, the same cryptocurrency. And as you can tell, I disagree with this attitude. But you know, I feel like the majority of the blockchain community is definitely you kind know, of realizing more that you know these are issues that we have to deal with. Right now, back to kind of the mainstream world. Right, there's um, political upheavals that I won't go into further because other people have talked about them already. And within the liberal radical movements, the kind of the, both the kind of upheavals of 2008 and then immediately right after that, these upheavals of 2016 led to some kind of a lot of, I think, soul searching and interest and reactions and new ideas among kind of many people, right? And here you know, we have uh, Glenn Weil um, who wrote these uh, really wonderful screeds that I encourage you to read on uh, where one is, explains kind of his differences with um, this uh, one, one of the kind of more mainstream reactions to these events, which is the kind of 1950s style centrally planned statism. And the um, second thing that he reacts to is basically people saying that we should just have free market capitalism with kind of slightly, uh, slightly more welfare and give people uh, universal basic incomes and so forth. So he basically um, argues here that, you know, because, uh, because of kind of things that we've learned and really because of things that we've known all along, they're like both of these kind of ideas are kind of intellectual dead ends. And if we want to actually achieve sort of the underlying ideals and values behind it, um, behind why people would want, you know, things like capitalism and things like socialism, we need some new and kind of different approach to uh, achieving them. So common threads between these two communities, right? So decentralization is a big one. Um, so um, basically um, you know, on the uh, cryptocurrency and, and blockchain side, you know, mm, blockchains are just intended to be decentralized. People just use that word all the time. People talk about decentralized autonomous organizations. People complain about mining centralization and see it as something bad. So people talk about decentralization as this sort of major goal in the uh, cryptocurrency and blockchain community um, all the time. Now, in the radical exchange community, um, how many people here agree with the uh, neo-reactionary opinion that the uh, solution to the problems of the United States is to go back to being ruled by King George III? Okay. Uh, King George IV, maybe? <laughs> Lee Kuan Yew? Hmm. Okay. So... Now, aside from uh, decentralization, uh, there's um, another um, kind of value um, among um, at least the community is, is just community itself, just like realizing that things like public goods matter, things like the need, the, the need to maintain kind of healthy public, discu public uh, discussion and healthy norms of discussion as a kind of com as a global commons, even between people who disagree with each other as uh, something important. The need to kind of reach between different constituencies and kind of talk and bring people together. Um, just valuing you know, the opinions of different people, in, uh, different people in the community trying to kind of make compromises and make common decisions. I think all of these things are you know, things that people in the radical exchange community value, but also things uh, that you know, this kind of cypherpunk community has kind of been sort of dragged and sometimes peacefully, sometimes kicking and screaming in kind of more um, into valuing more and more over time, right? And uh, now, 
That said, we both communities also value and in this um, word that Glenn really likes, which is polypolitanism, which is the idea that you no, know, there is no single kind of single community and kind of single way of categorizing people that defines us. And this is something that I mean, Glenn has talked about quite a uh, quite a bit explicitly. And even in the uh, blockchain space, for example, like one of the effects I've noticed that it has around the world is that it just just the fact that people end up identifying with these kind of cryptocurrency tribes or just going to these international conferences even just gives people an alternative for kind of something to consider as their as something to consider as their team to you know just their country for example and the um and even aside from that you know cryptocurrency is the sort of thing where you don't need to be part of one team you can be multiple teams and you can be part of the Ethereum community, but also be part of the Omise Go community, which is part of the Ethereum community. So it's the kind of blockchain space, I would say, is inherently kind of polypolitan in, in, in all of these ways as well. Now, another important kind of value of uh, both communities is mechanism design, right? So I think a lot of people are interested in things like quadratic voting, like liberal radicalism slash quadratic finance slash CLR, um, Harburger taxes, I mean, because these ideas are, I mean, they're not just a kind of radical, uh, they're not just radical in the way, in the way that many other ideas are, rad are, are, are radical. So they're not, for example, radical in the way that replacing everything with pure private property rights is radical. Right? These ideas are kind of radical in a way that has like a lot of really interesting and economic analysis behind it, and even kind of strong economic arguments for why some of these mechanisms actually are the optimal thing for doing what they um, what they intend to do. Right? So, you like quadratic uh, liberal ra radical funding just if you assume the, the kind of conditions of uh, the economic model, which realistically aren't really that much much more uh, difficult to assume than the conditions beh um, behind the kind of proofs for things like why competitive markets are optimal, then like it is just clearly the way to finance public goods. And so the fact that there is, that these are also just new social technologies with this kind of mathematical backing behind them as well is I think one of the things that interests a lot of people. Now in the blockchain space on the other hand, like mechanism design is the name of the game. Like, if you even just poke into any of the communities developing proof of stake consensus algorithms or sharded blockchain algorithms or plasma chains, state channels, like any one of these uh, you know, new buzzword technologies, all of them have a huge amount of just economic incentives and mechanism design at their very core. So these uh, four things are things that the, uh, are both in the radical exchange community and in many blockchain communities are very strong, right? So contributions to all of this from the radical exchange community, Harburger taxes, um, liberal radical matching, quadratic voting, a lot of just different ideas in terms of mechanism design. Now, what kind of interesting and of things does uh, the blockchain community bring to the table that the radical exchange community might find useful? Now, first of all, the blockchain community has been kind of incentivizing um, and leading to a lot of interesting work in areas like, for example, identity. So on the left, you have this, uh, the HTC blockchain phone, and uh, it has this feature where if you um, lose your uh, your phone or lose your or lose your private key or anything like that. Then before that happens, you have the opportunity to specify up to five uh, trusted contacts. And if you lose your key, then any three of those five contacts can uh, basically work together to help you recover your key. And this is all done in a kind of decentralized cryptogra uh, uh, cryptographic way using secret sharing. So you could even argue that this. Uh, um, M of N uh, social key recovery thing is a kind of special purpose um, identity system.
right? And it's a special purpose decentralized identity system. It basically tells the, in some ways it serves the function of telling the blockchain that, hey, you know, if this person actually is them using these kind of three or five trusted keys as evidence of that. Um, there's uh, zero knowledge proofs. So, so the um, crypto kind of space more broadly, and there's not just blockchains, there's also these sort of general pr uh, purpose zero knowledge proofs to let you prove that you did certain things and that you have data that conforms to certain rules without actually completely revealing what that data is. And this is a technology that's extremely useful in blockchains, but it's also extremely useful in many other kinds of mechanism design that demand privacy. And a lot of the mechanisms that Radical Exchange is working on actually do demand privacy. Um, also contributions from the blockchain community, just the blockchain itself as a base layer for many kinds of mechanisms. And also a lot of just interesting and weird and really out there work on uh, mechanism design for different purposes. This uh, thing at the bottom is a uh, Moloch DAO, which is um, another attempt at making a DAO, which is named after Moloch, the rationalist god of uh, coordination failure, which is named after the Canaanite god of child sacrifice. So <laughs> now one area of collaboration Security, security is a real issue, right? So um, in the case of uh, cryptocurrencies and blockchains, people lose, just losing their keys is something that happens and leads to terrible consequences. Better identity systems can help solve this. Now, if we start looking at voting systems, including regular voting, including quadratic voting, including CLR, unfortunately, including everything, one of the big problems with them is basically just fake accounts, right? And it's, Fake accounts are actually quite easy to get, and if you design systems naively, then you'll just create systems that are overwhelmed by random 14-year-old you know, like teenagers in Albonia that, ha that just have 50,000 accounts and just pretends to be a community that wants some public good funded when actually it's just buying themselves a Lamborghini. So crypto this is an interesting chart on um, differences between cryptography and game theory. Uh, so, in uh, cryptography and game theory are both kind of ways of achieving, kind of the, uh, in many cases, the goals of coordinating people. And cryptography and game theory have kind of some different uh, kind of parts to them, some, di uh, some different features, some different disadvantages. In game theory often has this weakness that it assumes that participants are not colluding with each other. And that's something that cryptography is actually pretty well suited to dealing with, right? Now, point of contention, identity. Identity is this one area where the still kind of very individualistic and kind of more cypherpunky side of the blockchain space just doesn't, like, just wants to stay very far away from it. Like identity is bad, identity is oppression. Identity means a hu human beings are reduced to numbers. Now, Glenn, on the other hand, um, has this wonderful tweet, which is um, basic, he's critical of Ethereum because it formalizes property, but not people, and this is bad. And there is, it's definitely true that blockchains are not sufficient for a lot of the problems Glenn wants to solve, because for if you formalize property and not people, then how do you distinguish between 10,000 people that all want some um, fun collective funding towards some public good versus 10,000 sock puppets of a teenager in Albonia that wants Lamborghinis. The two are literally mathematically distinguishable unless you have an identity system. So navigating this uh, kind of uh, di um, divergence of views and hopefully coming up with identity systems that serve the goals of, the of uh, both uh, movements, but still avoiding the kind of worst risks of them is something that I think we can uh, collaborate a lot on. So to summarize, right, these are two kind of very interesting and in many ways different, but also in many ways similar movements and communities. And both bring their own kind of very interesting and unique perspectives to the table, right? So blockchains, um, and people in blockchain communities think a lot about security, think a lot about adversarial models, think a lot about how do I deal with 14-year-old teenagers in Albonia that will want to break the thing. Um, and uh, radical exchange community focuses a lot, especially more on these kind of public good issues. And both have these interesting commonalities, like seeing things like money and other institutions as being social constructs and social technology that we can and should iterate and improve on and just generally valuing, you know, building things, deploying and experimenting. So thank you.
Merci beaucoup. Merci. So I assume many of you feel as lucky as I do to have just heard Vitalik talk and, uh, and about the nuances that he just outlined there. Um, I would say there's an, an, another overlap, and this is stepping away from, from the broader, which I think is in many ways more important, an overlap between Vitalik himself and uh, what Radical Exchange is hoping to be, which is this openness and nuance. And in many ways, we've gotten uh, a signal from Vitalik in his work for the types of values we should have on that path. Can we have one more round of applause? <laughs> so I have the pleasure right now of introducing uh, an impassioned uh, poet, a Detroit native, an LGBTQ activist, film producer, and founder of artists in Detroit. Natasha has been a member of four national slam, slam teams Started in national, started in a national Sprite commercial. Uh, she's a, a Shinola CNN ad she's been on, and she's a woman of World Poetry Slam three-time top five finalist. She has odd audiences across the world at more than 100 universities and venues, performing in stadiums for as many as 30,000 people. She's been featured in magazines such as Vogue, Entrepreneur, and many more. Natasha currently current, tours the world using her words to enlighten. We're very lucky to have her. Please welcome Natasha to the stage. How y'all feeling? Are y'all enjoying the conference so far? Um, all right, I am Natasha T. Miller, and uh, I am here to do a couple of poems and get out of your way. Uh, I always tell people, no matter what audience I'm in front of, um, if you like anything that I'm saying during a performance, you can feel free to snap, to clap, to throw things up here. Just don't break the monitor. Um, and I always say, if you don't like what I'm saying, you can pretend. Uh, I have to give you a fair warning that you all saw Tawana on the, the stage earlier. Um, so she just starts to whoop me in the middle of this poem. It's because she told me to use sunscreen on vacation and I didn't and now my face is falling off. Um, so she, yeah, I love Tawana. Anyway, uh, so here is, here is, I think it's uh, proper to, to do a poem about Detroit because we're in Detroit. Um, and give it up for Detroit, right? Uh, and it's, it's a very interesting thing that happens. Uh, I travel and I perform in a lot of spaces and people always ask me very weird questions about me being from Detroit. Um, I, I, like, I would go places and people would say things like, hey, I have a question. I'm like, what? They're like, you from Detroit? I'm like, yeah. They're like, have you ever been killed? I'm like, <laughs> I'm like I don't think so. I don't, I'm like calling my mom later like, have I died before? I don't know what's happening. Um, so a lot of people just have this, this misconception of what happens or what is happening in Detroit, especially with this other Detroit that's happening. Uh, right now, so I decided to write a poem to introduce people to, to what Detroit really is. After finding out where I was from, a woman on the train in Boston smiles and tells me not to worry. She hears that in the next five to 10 years, Detroit is going to be the Midwestern New York, I in turn worry, for obvious reasons. <laughs> the rats in New York are tall enough to drive taxis and the people in New York are seemingly allergic to saying, excuse me, those are problems we do not want today. Today, a few years later, I pick up a paper and the headline reads, welcome to the new Detroit. And I'm quickly reminded of something my grandmother once said, you can sell a house a hundred times, but the walls will still tell stories of the first family that owned it. So you can't just throw soil on top of a land of living people, then try and convince the outside world that our home was a graveyard before it began to blossom bike lanes and fine dining. This is not a city attempting to transition into another city. It's just Detroit. It's churches and old buildings that lean like drunk lovers but still open every Sunday for worship. It's Coney Island hot dogs and Fago pops on the days when you want to feel like you were the only one told a secret. It's what up, though, and water shutoffs. 
A woman planting flowers in potholes, a line straight out of a Tupac song is still here because we didn't change our zip code when our schools started shutting down and our sports team started losing and our air started smelling like gun smoke and new money is Motown. It's a homeless man and bright colors and musicless headphones on the corner of Selden, always dancing like his imaginary check had more money on it than he expected and yeah, and yes, sometimes the suburban folks treat the city like a party they weren't invited to show up, start fights, and then exit before the police show up. And yes, sometimes the police don't show up. It's not perfect, but it's a city that held its place in line until God returned from an extended lunch break, a place where any person on the streets will still politely give you directions, even when they themselves feel lost. It's a beast that swallowed my brother and countless other friends and family members long before their time. But home is wherever the most of your loved ones are buried. So to the woman on the train in Boston who thought that I was worried, to the couple in Seattle who wanted to know if my skin has ever tasted bullet, to the people trying to figure out which Detroit to believe, it's a complicated story with more semicolons than periods on its best days. It's still broken, but it works and it lives and it's ours still. Thank you. Um, And uh, a few different things. If uh, if you like anything that that I am saying, I am Natasha T. Miller, Instagram, Twitter, T. Miller Poetry, all of those things. Uh, if you pick up a copy of our Detroit uh, magazine this month, um, I wrote something about the significance of what up dealt in the city of Detroit. So uh, feel free to read that. And this poem that I want to um, end on is uh, I lived in Detroit my whole life and I was in Pittsburgh and I heard the story of a man who lived in uh, Detroit for 36 years, and then ICE came and deported him and took him away from his family. Um, and I wrote this poem in response to the bodies of other human beings being considered illegal. You are not a firearm in the hands of an unlicensed carrier. You are not 20 miles over the speed limit, not underage drinking or vandalism, not theft nor robbery. You are not illegal. You are human, a soul connected to a sore skin, connected to bones that are weary from working 10 times harder while getting paid 90% less. You are your grandmother's favorite child, your lover's favorite kiss, the suicide note that your parents carried across the borders on their backs. You are in coffins and Arlington's National Cemetery running into burning buildings and risking your life to save people who want you dead. You are the true definition of grace, making below minimum wage, barely surviving yet still sending money back home to your family. You are a healer. You are you are a provider. You are coming home every night with achy hands, tired feet, and still reading your children bedtime stories in a language that you've been hiding in your throat all day. You are the great in America. You are more American than the American president. You are not a job or a service or a status or a resident. You are not a bill being passed on the house floor in the middle of the night. You are flesh. You are bones. You are feelings. You are more than America's housekeepers. You are the house. You are the structure. And if you are forced to leave, you be the flames. You burn it down. You burn it down and you write your family's name in the ashes. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. So I kind of lied because I have three minutes left. So I feel like I have to do a poem because I have three minutes left. Um, and uh, and I've I've. I've done a lot of uh, these these conferences, and I think one poem that I that I was able to put on a stage at a race and economics conference over in Scotland uh, was due to the fact that I lost my brother here in Detroit. And to give you uh, some context about the grief work that I've been doing, in, in three days, I have a really big event at the Detroit Institute of Arts called the Science of Grief. And for 14 hours, people can come and talk about someone that they lost in their lives, um, just regular people. And I wrote this poem uh, just dedicated to the, the, this idea of people not saying the names of the people that they lost. Um, and it's called, they say. They say you shouldn't mourn over the loss of a drug dealer. They say the drug dealers stood on the tracks their whole lives, challenging the train, knew that even if the weather delayed it, death was still showing up at their front door. They say the drug dealers died so casually. 
Say what's his name's child on Joy Road or Rosa Parks was murdered in cold blood on his front porch. They say his. They don't say his name. They don't sympathize with the death of a drug dealer unless he was their drug dealer, gave them free drugs, paid their rent once, kept their lights on, gave their kids a Christmas. They don't give drug dealers backstories or reasons why. He's just another one. They say he purchased the engraving. So of course the bullets had his signature on them. They say his. They don't say his name. They say his funeral is next week. Say his funeral had a line to length of his rap she curled around the corner must have been popular probably could have been somebody don't talk about who he actually was they say his casket was nice say his mother was nice was burying her only son and still had enough strength to stand outside the church and laugh with his friends. They say his friends don't say his name treated like a weight. Their fragile tongues are too weak to hold. Don't want to make the mistake of humanizing. A drug dealer can't let the public know they care about a drug dealer. So they'll show you his chalk outline long before showing you his actual picture. They say his death. I say his death. I say, I say his gray sweats are still on a hanger in my closet, his cologne still on my dresser. I say it's been 1,842 days since my brother was killed and I haven't said his name once, afraid that the more times I say his name, the quicker I'll empty myself of his memories, afraid of remembering what his name tastes like, scared that it'll fall like ashes in my mouth, get buried underneath my tongue, turn my lips into a headstone that forces me to talk about him, to stop saying his, to say his name, to say Marcus, to say Marcus, to say my brother, his name was Marcus. Thank you, you all have been amazing. So we're about to bring up another panel, um, but I would first like another round of applause for Natasha, if we can. Um, one of our goals here was to show that this isn't a rationalist conversation, right? Um, and that the different faculties within us play a role in envisioning. Um, what better way than that to exemplify that? So I'd like to put up some slides here, and this is, this is extremely important to me. Um, if you've enjoyed this, converse, this conversation, this conference, um, there's a reason for it. Uh, we're a volunteer-based team of people that got inspired by Glenn's book and picked up the phone and decided to uh, get working, do 10 hours a week of work. Um, and we went through the trenches together uh, to get here. Uh, so I'd like to thank, personally, um, our, our funding team, which is led by Will, but we also had Omar, James, Mary, and Max, our marketing and PR team, and Ryan Corana, can't thank you enough for what wasn't 10 hours, it was over 20, uh, Chris, Tom, Manny, who also played a role in an operational context, and Fanny for coming in uh, late and really lifting a lot for us. We have a, a web team that renamed themselves along the way as our tech team because they were always looking past the conference to what they could invent, what they could build. Uh, that was uh, Mickey, Charlie, Matt Mazurka, Cody, Joss, and Nick. And that's one of the two slides. You can see our team is quite big. We had track captains supporting the track leads that you'll meet very shortly. Uh, this was Kia Krutler, um, Michael Nimrata, and Matt, who's also up here as a, as a deputy director as well. Uh, I won't go into too much detail around our board members and our track leads uh, right now, but they were um, they were the, the linchpins in all of this, in all of the tracks, all of the great content, the symbiosis of the content. Um, so uh, you can thank them for that. Uh, Avital on ticketing, which is quite an involved process. Um, all of your, your tickets and your responses to scholarships came from Avital. And then obviously you saw the great project fair that we had, and that was yeah, really Kelly and Nathan's work. So can I get another round of applause for these folks? Here? Um, so our, our goal on the third day was to catalyze action. And we've heard a lot of questions. What's next for radical exchange? Um, and we're not going to open this panel by promising you perfection, but we're going to promise you vision 
Uh, we're going to promise you commitment, and we're going to promise you uh, a bit more tangible ideas. I will ask, uh, and I'll, I'll mention it now, and I've mentioned it before, there are sign-up boards for some of the initiatives that you hear uh, in this conversation. So uh, at some point, feel free to go to the back and sign your name down if you want to get involved. Uh, but with that, let's, uh, let's start this conversation. And I'm, I'm very honored to, to moderate. If possible, if possible, could we first do introductions and then, and then I'll come back? Uh, hi, I'm Ananya Chakravarti. I'm assistant professor of history at Georgetown University, and I am the track lead for ideas and research for Radical Exchange. And I'm Matt Pruitt. I'm the deputy director of Radical Exchange, and I've also been uh, supporting the entrepreneurship and technology track. You've also been on the arts and communication track. I'm Jennifer Lynn Marone. I'm an artist and have been the track lead for Radical Exchange Arts and Communication. Um, before I introduce myself, I'd also like to give a special thanks to uh, Matt, Jeff, and Glenn, who put in more work than all of us in making this happen. Uh, I'm Mark Lutter. Uh, my day job is the founder and executive director of the Center for Innovative Governance Research, and I'm the activism and government track lead. So we're going to walk through, uh, I guess, uh, your left to right in a, in a story of sorts from a general uh, a general explanation of our vision to track specific initiatives that we have in place. Um, so I, if you could advance the slide, please, I'll, I'll start that. There we go. Okay, so a mission statement's important. If you go to our website, uh, as of now, there is a mission statement on there. There's an about section of Radical Exchange, um, and there's um, some elo eloquent verbiage in that mission statement. We decided that we wanted to update that mission statement, uh, and in conversation, Matt Pruitt took a, took a great cut at this and that we all agreed with, and there's some very key words. It was very um, selective in terms of how we outline this. Uh, so I'll read it, but I'll, I'll highlight some words after. So Radical Exchange aims to build a clear, coherent, and sustainable alternative to capitalism that embraces markets, egalitarianism, community, and decentralization. Um, the words all have purpose, right? Clear. We want to increasingly be tangible and, and understandable in, in, in what we're talking about here. Uh, coherent, it hangs together. Um, uh, clearly, we use the word capitalism. It is the structure that, for the most part, we find ourselves in. You've seen that we're not about a dogmatic view in that sense, but we are a, a view of recognizing the certain social structures that we're in today. Uh, in, the word egalitarianism is one we don't shy away from. This is the, the concept that we can find uh, equality in our discourse with each other, in our re recognition of diversity. And so how? Um, I was, I was cap captured by Matt Pruitt's um, conversation on art just recently, um, non-violently replacing capitalism. Um, and in non-violent, we mean let's do it in a uh, prudent manner. Let's have real dialogue between people. Let's do it through community building. Um, the words from within, so the concept of there are institutional structures today to navigate. And we have to recognize those institutional structures. We have to use the faculties um, at our disposal in different situations. We have to ask hard questions, um, but that has to be navigated. Uh, we're building communities and organizations that practice fair and more efficient forms of organization. Inherent to this is uh, challenging basic institutions. You've heard that many times over. Um, that is something that continually motivates us. The idea that social evolution doesn't stop with the 20th century right? Social evolution can continue, and part of that is the initial ideas for that ongoing evolution. Um, and then evolving the vision from bottoms up. Um, uh, this involves multiple perspectives, this involves multiple open conversations. Uh, and ultimately it's about a future that we think is brighter and one that we believe in, um, where ultimately power increasingly rests in diverse democratic organizations. 
Prost. So an interesting, in dialogue recently, very interestingly, the, the purpose, as we've defined it, is one where we're a facilitator, right? We will, in cases, show you initiatives, but ultimately, this is also a place to come to for resources, connection, inspiration. Uh, effectively, we're the, the square where you come to change ideas and find your collaborators, and that's what we want to serve. Um, we would like research to flourish out of this. Uh, we want this to be an organization that helps uh, labor get matched and help funders find other projects. Um, it's about letting a million flowers bloom. That's not uh, too cliche to use it. Um, the more diversity, the more perspective we get involved, um, the better the, the connections will be, the better the ideas will be. Um, uh, ultimately, we want this to be emergent creativity that we are a platform for. And so this, this conference serves a big role. There's conversations here, um, and it also serves as an opportunity to spark projects. Again, do sign up for the boards at the back. Um, but a, the goal here is to break the, the top-down approach that we're all too familiar with. Um, we do have goals of growing our community groups. We already have over 100, um, but we plan to grow that much more substantially. Glenn has the, the number of 1,000 in mind, um, but, but it's going to be much more than that. Uh, aim to grow by a factor of five to ten with each conference. So in terms of throwing metrics onto this, um, we, would, we would like to, our community to grow uh, in a number of times and then carefully consider how to build this network into a public good provider, which is this hard, challenging problem that we have to learn how to solve as, as social beings, really. Um, with that, I'll pass it on to what is about uh, four tracks uh, and their mutually reinforcing initiatives. Hi. Sorry. Uh, my name is Matt. I'm uh, speaking for the entrepreneurship and technology track, although I have to give credit to Mamie Ryan Gold for the amazing work that she's done in this track uh, so far. Uh, I think that, you know, as, as Jeff has alluded to, our, our goal really is to build each of these tracks into sort of uh, parallel organizations that are doing um, you know, related, mutually reinforcing work. And for the entrepreneurship and technology track, I think the mission briefly stated is to make radical mechanism design a must for technologists. We want this to be something that everybody who works on technology, everybody who runs technology companies is thinking about as something that is basically like an imperative. Um, and I, I also want to mention that I'm intensely... Uh, intensely conscious of the fact that these kinds of ideas can be co-opted. They can be, uh, if implemented incompletely or, 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 or wrongly, they can become window dressing. They can become a new mode of propagandizing or saying, oh, look, you know, we've got some kind of, you know, halfway uh, uh, Harburger taxation implementation here. Therefore, we are the, the right kind of technology company. I think that we have responsibility to um, to protect the, you know, the egalitarian core of these ideas and um, help people do them in the right way. Um, I was just, I was uh, inspired by Tristan Harris's use of the phrase uh, "race to the top" yesterday. I think that's exactly the kind of of dynamic that that we hope to create. We uh, we hope to, you know, live in a in a world where technology companies are uh, competing with one another to really, really do better. Um, in terms of um, advancing these kinds of goals. So more concretely, uh, we hope this track becomes sort of a consulting practice. We hope to support startups like the ones you saw yesterday in Project Exchange, uh, whose work is advancing uh, egalitarian uh, economies and um, uh, incorporating these kinds of ideas into products that will inform the way people live. Um, and of course, we also want to raise awareness beyond the technology world and the business world um, of you know the issues posed by living in a world of increasing returns, uh, the value of of uh, data, um, network rents, things like that. Um, so, through consulting, labor matching, and perhaps some of our own uh, ecosystem building, um, you know, we are optimistic about our ability to move things in the right direction. Um, so there's a few more uh, kind of questions that I want to pose that are uh, questions that the entrepreneurship and technology track will have to answer. Um, 
Uh, one of them is, you know, def more precisely defining the role of blockchains in reducing power concentration. Um, another question is, how do we precisely value data? How do we value intellectual property? How do we, these are just deeply tricky intellectual problems that we want to take seriously and come up with better answers to. Um, uh, we've also had several great conversations at this conference about uh, the health of public discourse. How do we get our arms around that? How do we figure out what a better public discourse looks like? How do we measure it? How do we know if we're moving in the right direction? Um, and finally, there are, um, you know, more ambitiously, there are uh, troubling problems, troubling issues out there about, you know, the dynamics of technological progress in general. How do we avoid arms races, existential threats, really worrying, stuff like that. Um, these are the kinds of uh, problems that we hope to bring people together and uh, set to work on. So with that, I'll hand it to Jen. Hi, everyone. Um, with the Arts and Track Committee, which includes Ruth Catlow, Kia Kreutler, Primavera de Filippi, Matt Pruitt. Um, we also had Brett Scott at the beginning and B. Cavello. Together, we, we kind of created our own mission as well, where the arts and communication track introduces the imagined and the real into the territory of radical markets. Artistic and narrative practices in this track explore and interrogate the motivations and implications of proposals put, put forth by Radical Exchange and its community. Presentations are in a variety of formats that range from the speculative propositions to actual models, all of which are distilled through the lens of culture. As mechanism design becomes a stand-in for political economy, the arts become a necessity. In the broader sense, um, it's critical, it is the critical and unsuspecting field where inquiry, experimentation, and the envisioning of a better world is not only possible, but realizable. And what we mean by this is that we, we have the ability um, by using arts, whether we're your artists yourselves or just by using um, certain practices, like we had our workshop just earlier on creative writing, it allows one to, to kind of break free from maybe the boundaries that they're stuck in, in their professions or in their, in their um, like academic life. And to imagine without fear of deploying something maybe like in technology circles. Um, or that you're going to unleash it and to explore it, to, to see the critical boundaries of where you might need to refrain or where you could go further. So that was really important. And then, oops. So some of our goals were to explore and experiment with the ideas through narrative and artistic practices. Um, we also aim to inspire and catalyze new collaboration projects with other tracks to test theories and models by building instantiations that the public can experience and interact with, which allow us to see which perspective, not only our own, do we end up where it doesn't work for, for one person but might work for another. Communicate visions of present and future alternatives to a broader audience to explore how what could be actually might feel like emotionally. Um, Natasha's poetry was a great example of that. I was, Ananya and I were over there crying. <laughs> um, but, but that is not just theories and models and we need to remember how things are going to feel. What, what world do we want to live in? What, what does that feel like emotionally? And how it, will it feel for others? To learn from one another as well and deepen the sophistication of the movement. Um, some of our activities, these might sound vague, but we're still developing them, communicate the ideas and visions, so through speaker programs, through uh, perhaps cartoon books, um, develop educational materials, they could be games like Cost, um, which is not one that we developed, but was from the community. Create critical awareness, so this again with like instantiations and inviting people to also not teach you how to think critically, but show you some ways of doing that. And support creative projects through grants, open calls and fellowships, things like that. We're still working on the exact details. And I'm gonna pass it to Mark Luter. Thank you, I have a mic. All 
All right, how does this work? There we go. All right. Um, so I'm the activism and government track lead, and our primary mission was to create a network of doers who can share strategies and best practices for the implementation of radical exchange. And I want to, I guess, maybe scare you guys a bit to start. This is only the beginning. We are seeking very fundamental changes in the social organization of society. This is a tremendous project. This will require a huge amount of work. This will take years, if not decades, to see the full fruit of our actions. And in undertaking this, I think it is important to be cognizant and strategic in the early decisions that we make in terms of creating an inclusive culture, in terms of bringing on board the people we want to bring on board. This is the, the seed, this is the spark of something new that can hopefully shape the world for the better. And so in putting together the activism and government track, some of the things I was thinking about was, one, this, this should be a global movement. So bring together people from different parts of the world. We had people from North America, South America, Africa, and Europe um, represented on, on, the Afri on, on the activism and government track. Why? Because they all bring dif different perspectives and they can create the foundations of a network as we grow, there can be this sharing, there can be these deep personal relationships that allow for the successful implementation of uh, the ideas of radical exchange. Second is having this, this representation from different aspects of the activism and government track. So this includes government representatives, people who are inside the beast who know how it works, people from think tanks who can right, work with these, 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 these ideas and, and translate them from, for example, the scholarship and activism track down to what does it mean to implement these in practice to the activists who are, who are down getting their hands dirty, really promoting these ideas. And three, some of the, the, I think, attributes I would like us to embody and to imbue in this movement are intellectual curiosity. We might be wrong about several things. We probably are going to be wrong about several things. We should not be dogmatic, we should be open, we should be willing to learn and to course correct when we make initial mistakes. Um, similarly, uh, uh, humility. There are many instances in history of radical social change going awry. Uh, the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution. And in thinking about radical social change and how we can make the world a better place, we should not be complacent with how it is, but we should also not disrupt to the extent that it causes widespread suffering currently functioning uh, social institutions. And that's a fine line to walk. And so, for example, my, my personally, my favorite ideas in radical markets are in some sense the most challenging to implement, the Harburger tax and quadratic voting. And so if we think about the Harburger tax, one of the places that it might be implemented initially is the spectrum market. And that would be great and that would lead to good outcomes. At the same time, I don't think that's why we're here. Uh, for example, if we look at uh, uh, auction markets in Spectrum, these are good outcomes, but outside a bunch of nerds, it, 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 it hasn't fundamentally changed the, the social organization of society. So when thinking about the Harburger tax, how do we start with these small experiments and then how do we blow them up as we figure out exactly how to implement these to have the social impact that we want to have. Similarly, how do we create and maintain these relationships and these bonds such that we are aware of the experiments of the implementation of these ideas occurring around the world? How do we make sure we learn from what works? How do we make sure we implement it in other places adjusting for the necessary local context? And I see I'm not giving Ananya very much time, so I will stop here and uh, transfer over. All right, so for ideas and research, um, let me start by saying that, it, how many of you heard about the scandal in academ academic admissions? Oh yeah, yeah. Academia is capitalism, we need to change that. So part of what this is about is, uh, at least for me, 
the vision for the next year is to actually imagine how do we create a new research cluster um, um, and, and one of the things that I want to break down is this idea that research is something that is confined to academia, right? Now, what I want to, what I'm, what I take inspiration from is two seemingly very different fields, but I think um, it, they have important lessons for us in thinking about how to create uh, a new research cluster. One is queer studies, and those of you who don't know the history of queer studies, I recommend Harry Menton's book, Di Departing from Divergence, um, which. Uh, which models an amazing way um, for us to think about what a research cluster might look like because it was from the beginning, it was multidisciplinary, it was activist scholarship, and there was an extremely close relationship between academe and, social cons and its social constituents. The second field is data science, which brought together new and old disciplines, and the growth of the field was achieved very quickly through formal institutional mechanisms and relevance to a wide variety of real-world applications. So those are the two things that I'm really taking inspiration from. So in terms of um, the strategies for founding this, I, I want to create a thematic coherence across disciplines, but there is no hierarchy of disciplines, right? We're not privileging any one mode of knowledge making. So this is not, you know, somehow economics is more valuable as a way of understanding the world than anthropology or history or literary studies. And, you know, our, if you attended any of our academic panels, you saw just how incredible the research in all of these different fields that like we had 15 different fields represented. Um, so the annual conference is one of the places where we want to create a venue for um, uh, sharing new research. But the most important thing that we want to do is to create this intellectual commons, which I'm going to talk to you about. And the second thing that's really at the heart of our vision for the next year is that is ha this has to be student-centered. Right? Nurturing and empowering students is crucial to our goal, and we want to build a really strong relationship between our track and RXC students. The intellectual commons, the idea for it comes from the fact, how many of you have ever actually tried to publish in an academic journal? How miserable was that? Yeah. And how, and how many of you do uncompensated peer review for academic journals? Yeah, how miserable is that? Yeah. <laughs> so that is really the process that we're trying to disrupt. And part of the insight for this comes from the fact that the byline of any paper is a lie, because actually we all contribute to the creation of an intellectual product. And we want to actually think about a distributed model of creating intellectual products. So, the, the, so there's a partial common ownership model that's built into the platform, and the second is a rapid, transparent, and participatory process of peer review, um, which circumvents both the possibility of sort of academic gatekeeping and also encourages constructive participation. So basically, um, any paper that's uploaded into the, into the uh, platform um, is going to have three categories, if you will, of authorship. It's, um, the first will be credit claiming authors, and here we really want to um, um, you know, allow junior scholars who require these bylines for career advancement, they should be the ones who can claim credit in sort of traditional academic uh, journals, right? Partial common owners include senior co-authors who are willing to cede credit to junior scholars, right? This is something worth thinking about. Research assistants, and this is the most important thing, peer reviewers whose contributions substantially affect the final intellectual product, right? And in addition, signatories are also uh, encouraged on this. Now, uh, for the peer review process, so this is very different. This is why we need you all involved, right? Instead of having a small select group of editors who decide what does and does not pass muster, we're going to have many editors, so we reduce the burden on them, and all they have to do is basically say, is this competent, right? Is this good enough to actually be on the platform? The peer review process is actually... Um, transparent, anybody on the platform can, can, and can engage. But it is transparent, which is to dis so it's not anonymized, it's to disincentivize gatekeeping and to disincentivize non-constructive criticism. No reviewer to nonsense, right? The process is neutral to a center dissent, so dissenting reviewers can still become partial common owners if they affect the paper. And early and substantial engagement is incentivized because reviewers can become partial owners. In light of new scholarship, a published paper can also be reop reopened for debate, allowing us to archive the evolution of an intellectual product. Now, to 
We're hoping that the commons will basically create a new type of intellectual community, one that it's embodies our core values as, as a community and as an organization. And, it, and I, what I really wanted to do is to bypass the kind of increasing fracturing of academic research into elite enclaves and encourage collaboration across the class structure of academia. And I don't just mean that within the US, I mean that globally, right? So scholars in the global south should be as important to the process of creating intellectual products as scholars in the global north, right? <laughs> the commons will serve as a repository of ideas for all of our tracks and for our community. And we want the commons also not just to think about rigorous academic research, but also serve as a pedagogical resource for student-centered academic practice. We believe the long-term success of our plan as an organization is in our youth. And this depends first and foremost in our track for, with our students, both at the graduate, especially at the undergraduate levels, and we're eventually hoping to actually be able to move into the school education levels as well. So we're in, interested in fostering pedagogical experiments aligned with our research interests and principles, and to foster future leaders of radical exchange. So get involved. So if you are an academic, you can, uh, or a currently a student, you can join RSE students or sign up to mentor our students. This is really important. We want you to think about how you can participate in the comments, whether by contributing work or actually um, just uh, signing up to become an editor. And we're also, and this is really important, we're also looking for people who want to step up and take on leadership positions within our track. So look out for elections, it will be quadratic, and, <laughs> and thank you very, very much. Uh, just a quick call to action. Um, we want all of you to be involved uh, with our work in whatever way you want to be. Uh, we hope to create a real uh, network of, of interested people. and. Uh, so if you don't mind, before you leave, uh, make sure to uh, uh, check out that whiteboard in the back of the room, which uh, has like commitments that you can make, things that you want to be involved with uh, over the next year or so. Uh, write down your name and uh, stay in touch with us. Thanks. Thank you. We're not quite done. Uh, we have uh, a very important speaker yet to come up, which is our founder and chairman, Glenn. Um, can I get one more round of applause, though, for uh, our track leads? Put on the um, I am uh, meant to do a housekeeping item right now as well. Uh, just uh, a note that we have a bus going to the airport in addition to the West End, so uh, if that helps you. That's good. So finally, we will invite uh, Glenn to address the audience, founder and chairman of Radical Exchange. Um, thanks to everyone, um, and thanks for sticking around. Uh, there's a couple of thanks that have not quite been made yet, um, and I think uh, uh, Mark alluded to it a little bit, but um, the truth is that uh, Jeff has really worked his fingers to the bone for no compensation for the last eight months. And he's really been an, he's been an inspiration to all of us. Um, he got into this in August with nothing but spirit. Um, and he built this beautiful community from the ground up. So um, it's been such an honor to work with him. But, but the truth is that as much as Jeff did, and he did an incredible amount, no one person, no small group, no cluster built this community. Everybody here and the 10 or 100 times as many people who couldn't be here, people who are watching online, all of you are the ones who built this community. So much of my work <laughs> over the last year has just been looking at people on Twitter, wherever, when I go and give talks, and saying, we want you as part of this community. You have so much more to give to us 
than we have to give to you, join us. And so many of you have responded to that call. Uh, I bet, I don't know, 20% of the people in this room, if not more, got a message from me saying, come, start a local group, come be involved somehow. Um, you all are the lifeblood of this organization, and this is truly a collective effort. And, and the truth is, a huge part of what we are critiquing about our present society is the crazy individualism which says that collective efforts are the private property of some arbitrarily chosen dude in a t-shirt. And that is an insanity. It's a disease. It's a failure of imagination. And um, it has destroyed one idealistic project after another. And we won't let that happen to this community. I was called, maybe briefly, um, to channel intersecting currents, which we've all been talking about, so that we could all convene together. And now that we're all together, so many leaders that I've met throughout this process are coming up to help inspire this community. That mission statement is beautiful. I just tweeted about it. I had never read that before. I never heard it. I thought it was a perfect expression of our values. And in the spirit of that, I think it's so important that we are constantly pushing forward new leaders, constantly reaching out democratically to this community that we're building. And for that reason, I wanna bring forward uh, two leaders who some of you are just getting to know, some of you know a little bit better, um, who are going to be leading the organization for the coming year um, as uh, jointly as the two uh, central leaders. Uh, Jen and Matt, would you mind coming up? So, so, so as Jen made clear, our, you know, this started as an economics thing. This is not an economics thing, as Ananya made clear. Um, and as Jen made clear, arts are not peripheral to this community. Arts are at the heart of this community. Um, communication, dialogue with broader and broader publics are at the heart of this community. I wouldn't, I'd say the things I talk about now, maybe 30% of them were in the book. And the rest of them came from your questions, from the people who screamed at me, Zoe Hitzig. Zoe Hitzig, who's my collaborator, who many of you know, I first met her because she said, oh, you can't take seriously how individualistic you know, your book is and how it, everything is so economistic. Yeah, you can't be serious about that. And I said, and I argued with her, and I like arguing. Many of you know I like arguing. And I ended up changing the way I talk about things because of those conversations. Um, and so I'm so thrilled to have Jen and Matt uh, be uh, uh, assuming leadership um, as we all rotate through different roles within this community. Um, I don't know, Jen and Matt, whether you want to uh, say anything. Um. Uh, I guess the first thing to say is I'm just incredibly grateful uh, to you all for being interested in this and for being at this conference and for making it, uh, in my opinion, like an amazing success. Uh, I'm just so happy to see the conversations that have been going on, the uh, ideas that are developing, and I can't wait to uh, you know, meet everybody here and work with you, you all in the future. Yeah, it's been an incredible experience, and it's amazing that we were able to pull this together and we had such a wonderful um, participation and all of you came. Um, in just six months that we met, basically. <laughs> and Glenn early on expressed that he didn't want this to become about him. And Matt and I don't want this to become about us. It's just about coming together. It's about the values we all espouse. And that's what has resonated through everything that has happened over the past days. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we are not gonna become these demagogues either. Mm -hmm. We're looking for people to, to come and join us in this position um, and in all the tracks and to build this community and the work that we do and the work that's for all of us and for the future. It's not about me or Glenn or Matt or any particular individual. It's about the, system, the community. Thank you. Uh, 
I have to say this community means so much to me. The people here, I've never felt so alive, so at home. And um, there's a um, there's an idea uh, that Vitalik referred to earlier that I call polypolitanism. It was actually a term coined by Danielle Allen, another example, someone who's not even here, a philosopher at Harvard, another idea that came uh, forward. And um, to me, the idea of polypolitanism is that we're all defined by so many communities that we're a part of. There is no one leader. We are all leaders in different combinations of communities. Some of us will be called to be very focused in one area and then step back and find other areas where we contribute. Writing that book was so valuable to me and the last months, everything has been about building community to me. And now maybe for a while, Jen and Matt will be primarily focused on building community. And maybe I'll have a bit more time. Maybe we'll write another book. Maybe we'll collectively, we'll write something. And it's not just a book. Maybe it'll be collaborative. Maybe it'll be multimedia. I want everyone within this community, I hope, to take on those leadership roles and then move back into other areas where they want to build community, where they want to contribute, where they see themselves most called to lead and add. This is the community and the fight of my life. And I see so many ways uh, for me and for all of you over time differently as we're called to contribute. So thank you for taking on this leadership, Jen and Matt. It means so much to me. And you've already given so much to the community. And I hope all of the rest of you in this room will find ways um, to be leaders as well. Thank you. Thank you.